Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Late Night Talk with me, your host Ahmed Ali, and another night from Muharram in Muharram, live from the holy city of Karbala. Now, many wonder across the world, whether you're Muslim or from a different religion, what is the most important aspect within religion? Many have given different answers to that question, whether it's love, whether it's freedom, justice, loyalty, and other aspects as well. But tonight, since it is the night of Al-Abbas, peace and blessings be upon him. As we mentioned earlier uh, in the nights before, we said that every night of Muharram is dedicated to a certain individual to be commemorated and remembered in a specific night of Muharram. And tonight, the seventh night in Muharram marks the night of Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas alayhi salam. We have processions. If you do hear loud noises, mawakib, uh, passing by, we do apologize for that in advance uh, because it just escalates from, from now on as the, the sound, the mawaki, the processions, they escalate from today. Now we do have a very special guest joining us tonight to talk about the most important aspect within religion, specifically within the religion of Islam, Sheikh Abbas Panju. Sheikh, assalamu alaikum. Good evening. How are you? Alhamdulillah. 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 Allah khalikum. Now, uh, Sheikhna, uh, I know you're, you, you've been away. We did the, uh, the ceremony, the banner exchange ceremony, and then you went away for a little bit to, uh, uh, you know, on a journey from Kalthumiya to Samarra, and then uh, you came back to Karbala. Now, before we get into uh, the whole uh, important aspect issue, uh, I want to talk about your journey a little bit. Sure. You know, because it's, it's a very spiritual journey. To right away come to Karbala the next morning, Go to Kazmuya, from there go to Samarra and back to Najaf and back to Karbala. Alhamdulillah wa shukar. This is from the bounties and the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that uh, disobedient slaves like ourselves Allah are still Allah. granted the honor of visiting the pure and uh, divine precincts and mausoleums of the selected Imams of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. After the flag changing ceremony here in Karbala, we left for Madain the very next morning after Salatul Fajr. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were able to uh, visit and do recordings, which inshallah, I'm sure are gonna be broadcast on the inshallah, channel yes. for the shrine of Salman al-Muhammadi and Hudayfa. Oh. And uh, from there, uh, we were able to go to visit the sites of uh, the Nawab of our 12th Imam, Ajalallahu oh, Ta'ala Farajahu yes. Sharif. Yes. From there, we left for Samarra. We were blessed to spend the night in Samarra. Alhamdulillah wa shukar and uh, shed a little bit of light on the lives of Imamain al Askariyain, Sayyida Narjis, Sayyida Hakima, uh, the Sardab where the 12th Imam was last seen, wow. and Alhamdulillah the different places of Mazarat within Najaf al Ashraf, yes. in addition to the uh, Haram of uh, Amir al Mu'minin, salawatullahi wa salamahu alayhi. Uh, Kufa is a place uh, with great. Um, you could say history yes and kufa in itself plays a very strategic role in the future it does. leading up to yomul qiyamah wow kufa as a city in itself has ideological importance and inshallah alhamdulillah wa shukar inshallah we hope that uh, these recordings and these documentaries will be uh, beneficial inshallah for for the viewers inshallah wa shukar it's beneficial astaghfirullah trust me when i say that from the uh, kindness of your heart allah khalikum uh, inshallah and sayyidna sheikh afwan to actually the the trip you went on it's, it's a huge mission you know I mean? From you know three days to four days, I believe, uh, going to different cities. Uh, although the situation in Iraq has you know a little bit uh, calmed down, uh, but you know, Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah, wa shukar, Habibi Ahmad. To be very honest with you, um, there is full safety and aman Mashallah. all the way up to Mada in Samarra. Oh, Many wow. times, Zawar have this uh, the fear within yeah. them or this doubt that things are not safe. Yeah. But Alhamdulillah wa shukar, you see there is safety all the way from Mada into Baghdad and from Baghdad down to Samarra wow. and back to Karbala Najaf. Beautiful. And it's as safe as any other place you, wow. you have within the world. And this over here requires um, a point of salutation and yes. respect it without does. doubt to the Hashd al-Sha'bi al-Muqaddas. Yes. Um, these uh, honorable people from the land of uh, Iraq who responded to the call of the Marja'iyah 
and have protected the blessed lands of Iraq and the virtuous people of Iraq from the Dawaish yeah. and the Najis Nawasib. Yeah. You see the efforts and the sacrifices that they've given all the safety that we have, the fact that you and I and millions of other people are able to come and visit the the shrines of Ahlul Bayt. Yeah. This is That's all it. due to the sacrifices of the Hashd al-Sha'bi. This is due to the sacrifice of that woman whose husband went out to become a martyr to secure Iraq, to free Iraq from terrorism. Yeah. He leaves behind six Beautiful. orphans. And it is on the sacrifice of people like this that you and I are able to come and pledge allegiance to our Imam it is. for definitely respect and salutations, du'as and any form of support for the Hashd al-Muqaddas. Insha'Allah. And uh, yesterday I was getting comments uh, as to why when I talk <coughs> about Muharram or we talk about Muharram, we say beautiful. You know, sure. Because uh, it's, it wasn't us that, and, and Sheikh, you can probably comment on that, it wasn't us that actually said beautiful was Zainab when Yazid asked her, uh, how do you find the, the, the will of Allah, you know, decreeing upon your brother? And Absolutely. she says, I did not find other than beauty. Of it was course. just pure beauty. So when we do say beautiful, Sheikh, it's, it's just that uh, it is tragic. You know, we are grieving. But at the same time, uh, the, 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 the vibe that emanates from Karbala is just Absolutely. beautiful. Beautiful in the sense that Habibi Ahmed from two dimensions. Number one, beautiful in the sense that Sayyidah Zainab says, I didn't see anything but beauty in that. Despite this gruesome, merciless manner in which Sayyidah Shuhada was martyred, together with his companions, she saw beauty in the fact that Sayyidah Shuhada submitted to the command of Allah, yes. was willing to undergo this sacrifice in order for countless infinite number of people to have access to guidance, to have access to deen and religion yes. for generation onwards till Yomul Qiyamah. Yes. So this act of self-sacrifice in order to be a beacon of light and guidance for the rest of humanity, say the Zainab so beauty in this, yeah. in that he was willing to undergo all sort of persecution and oppression for the sake of guidance of mankind. Mm -hmm. And this in itself is beauty because yes. you do not find the definition of beauty in itself in Islam is something that's fascinating. Mm -hmm. Beauty in the sense that how many people do you find in this world who are willing to sacrifice themselves, their families for the benefit of other people? Yes. Ideological benefit over yes. here. Number two, the humanity. The humanity in that these are champions, battalions and guardians of every act of virtue that we find in the world today. If we have freedom, it's because of the sacrifice of Sayyidah Shuhada. If we have justice, it's the sacrifice of Aba Abdullah alayhi salam. Anything in regards to humanity or goodness, Imam al Hussein stood up to defend these values. Yes. If, these, if we learn about these values, if these values even exist, or if they are implemented to a certain extent, all that returns back to Imam al Hussein. And this is what Sayyidah Zainab alayhi salam saw from the sacrifice of Ashura. Amazingly said, Sheikhna. And uh, you know, to touch upon two points you mentioned earlier with the Hajj al-Shaabi and the people that defended Iraq, uh, the brave warriors, and then you come to Hassan alayhi salam. There's one aspect that links them together. And tonight, we want to talk about the most important aspect uh, within the religion of Islam, within religions as a whole, because as, as you may know, or everyone knows, uh, inshallah you can tell us, they all are divinely revealed religions, so they have one thing in common. Absolutely. Now, uh, what is the most important aspect within the religion of Islam or religions in general? Sure. You will find that in order to answer this question, there are a different, there are a number of dimensions mm -hmm. through which we are able to answer this question. Yes. There is one dimension which is associated to the usul din okay. which is associated to Aqidah, okay. and this is the foundation of the flourishing of the religion in its entirety. So, what's usul din? Usul din, yani the you could say the five fundamental concepts upon which Islam as uh -huh. a religion is built in so terms of belief. So, I'm sorry? The pillars, can we say? The, pillars, the pillars of, of Islam? Islam, absolutely. Usul, foundation or pillars. So, mm -hmm. Tawheed, oneness in Allah subhanahu yes. wa ta'ala. Adala, the justice of yep. God. Mm -hmm. Nabuwa, the uh, necessity, logical necessity for God to send down prophets in order to Prophet, guide mankind. Yeah. So, prophethood. 
number four, imama, mm -hmm. successorship towards Rasulullah, towards the Holy Prophet. And the fifth one, ma'ad, yani the afterlife. The day, yeah, and from yeah, the, the afterlife, day. you have the day of judgment. Mm -hmm. For the, the entire religion, as a religion, as a way of life, is built on these five principles, on these five pillars. And you find that from within these five pillars, in order for the deen to flourish, in order for a person to attain perfection and prosperity in eternity, for eternity, there are certain traits that are absolutely fundamental in regards for this goal or this religion to manifest itself. Mm -hmm. You find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala points towards this within the Quran where he says, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, um, the part of the verse that goes on to say, Wa ati Allah, wa ati ur Rasul, wa ulil amri minkum. Obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, obey the Prophet and the ulil amr. Ulama from the Amma and the Khasa are unanimous on the opinion that ulil amr as per the tafsir from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam ulul amr is Amir al-Mu'minin Ali ibn Abi Talib and the ma'asum infallible imams from his lineage. So you find that within the Quran Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says this religion is built upon the principle of obedience. Wow. Number one towards the creator of the universe. Mm -hmm. How do we manifest our obedience towards the creator of the universe? by uh, showing our obedience towards the Prophet because the Prophet is the representative of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Obedience towards the Prophet entails obedience towards Allah. Yes. So obedience towards the Prophet and then the ulil amr, yani ahlul bayt. Obedience towards ahlul bayt results in obedience towards Rasulullah yes. which in turn results in obedience yes. towards yes. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If the foundation of religion is built on obedience towards Allah Rasul and Ahlul Bayt yani ikhtisar we say that obedience towards Ahlul Bayt so from here it is understood obedience towards them is obedience towards Nabi and Allah yes Azza wa Jal obedience towards Ahlul Bayt mm -hmm. meaning what what unconditional submission in every aspect of our lives mm -hmm. and this entails loyalty therefore if we were to analyze your question and we were to break down the complexities and the complex structure of religion, mm -hmm. what allows religion to flourish, what allows a person as a religious person to flourish and attain perfection, the necessary trait which must be exhibited as deduced from this verse of the Quran is loyalty. Mm -hmm. Because the fact that you are submissive and you are obedient to the Imam of your time in every aspect of your life, whether okay. it is in your interest or against your interest, this denotes what? Mm -hmm. Loyalty. Mm -hmm. And you find that when we discuss and when we analyze the revolution of Sayyid al-Shuhada, uh, you find that this trait of loyalty shines out. This trait of loyalty in itself was an imtihan for the people. You find that from within the revolution of Karbala, mm -hmm. there are those people who showed the highest level of loyalty. Rather, they set out a brand new definition for loyalty not witnessed by mankind before Ashura. And on the other hand, we have examples of people who failed to exhibit any sort of loyalty who failed to exhibit any sort of compliance yes. towards the Ahlul Bayt and this led towards their eternal damnation. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, we talked about obedience and we talked about loyalty. So uh, it's safe to say they go hand in hand. But is it blind loyalty that we're talking about or is it just, uh, you know, the, the cognizant understanding alongside loyalty? Loyalty in the sense that, see, loyalty leads towards obedience. The first thing that needs to be understood or the first thing that needs to be achieved is ma'rifa. Okay, so un under okay. understanding, cognizant okay. understanding. Yes. If I have fully understood through ilm by seeking knowledge and dalil and burhan, I come to the conclusion that mm -hmm. the imams of Ahlul Bayt are infallible. Yes. And I am convinced and I have full conviction 
that obedience towards them is obedience towards Allah. Allah yeah. I fully understand that they are infallible yes. in all their judgments, in their actions, in their words. Then what happens is that this ma'rifah then entails loyalty. As long as I'm convinced that this Imam is the path to eternal salvation, whatever he commands me to do or commands me to not do, regardless of whether with my limited intellect, mm -hmm. regardless of whether I'm able to understand the wisdom behind the command of the Imam or whether I'm not able to understand the wisdom of the Imam, yes. this does not deter me from being loyal to the Imam. So okay. in this sense, ma'rifah, mm -hmm. true ma'rifah leads to blind loyalty. Mm -hmm. When the Imam says stand, stand. The Imam says sit, sit. This is what is expected from a nation in order to prosper. This mm -hmm. is what is expected in order for humanity to prosper. Because it is through loyalty and submission to the Imam that the rule of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is able to be implemented. And the rules of Allah, the law of Allah depend on two things, ya Habibi. Mercy and justice. Mm -hmm. Now, some may argue the fact uh, that humanity, according to uh, the, the, the narrations you're addressing, uh, so humanity was made to be ruled by certain individuals, Absol or were they, uh, you know, destined to be the masses of, our, of, of, of themselves? Rulership or leadership in Islam under divine leadership mm -hmm. what we say loyalty towards the imam and rulership towards the imam We're talking about blind loyalty absolutely why and i'll tell you why yes. blind loyalty because this imam who is infallible yes is the representative of god yes our blind loyalty towards him ensures the success and the prosperity of humanity yes so long as we are loyal to the imam freedom prevails on earth mm -hmm. so long as we are loyal to the imam non-violence prevails on the earth the imam has got you a, a nation that is loyal and through their loyalty the imam is able to dispense the teachings of islam which have absolutely no selfish goals no selfish agenda mm -hmm. but in itself for humanity to prosper yes. so what the imam is basically what we can summarize in simple words is that the Imam says, give me your loyalty and I ensure your success in the dunya and the akhirah. Okay. Therefore, it is not a dictatorial sort of rule. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm trying to get at. Can sure. No, it is a loyalty that has been uh, a loyalty that is exercised out of ma'rifah. Nice. Knowing that the Imam rules with the rule of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and every rule that is ordained within the religion is for the betterment of mankind mm -hmm. because they are underlined by the rules of mercy yes. and the rules of justice. Mm -hmm. And you find that this was the government of Amirul Mu'mineen, yes. salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi. So long as the people were loyal to him, Amirul Mu'mineen eradicated poverty from the entire of Kuf. You find that even there was these um, exceptional cases of poverty. There were one or two. This is the only government in the world where poverty in the capital city of the ruler was an exception. Yani a poor person was an exception to the norm. In the, during the time of Amirul Mu'mineen, taxes, homes that was collected from Africa, there were surpluses. They didn't know what to do with the surplus tax. You can imagine today Africa, the most poor country, that continent. Is on earth during the time of amirul mu'minin it was the richest continent on earth they were sending surplus taxes to hijaz wow. why loyalty towards the imam ensures success prosperity and bliss just like the way when people were loyal towards rasulullah the earth saw the most best times in terms of governance mm -hmm. uh, in ensuring that the people are able to succeed uh, within the dunya as well as in the akhirah. Mm -hmm. So the answer to your question again over here is that cognizant ma'rifa, cognizant seeking of ilm, the natija or the consequence of this is loyalty. Mm -hmm. And not only loyalty, <coughs> blind loyalty. Mm -hmm. And you find that the imams have been oppressed to a great extent because the people around them were not loyal to them. Yes. We're not loyal to their cause. And we have to understand over here, loyalty to the Imam denotes loyalty towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yes. Loyalty towards the Prophet mm -hmm. uh, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. sallam. Now, some may also argue uh, the fact that if we were to look at the other hand, the, 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 on the contrary uh, of this argument, uh, wouldn't loyalty lead to oppression? Because if someone is so loyal to someone, 
that person can manipulate them. You know, you know we're, we're talking about general loyalty right now because we're talking loyalty in Islam as in today or back then. Sure. You know, loyalty to Ahlul Bayt, we got over that because if you follow them, you're following Rasulullah and you're following Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But wouldn't loyalty also reach a certain extent of, uh, you know, exploitation of, uh, or, or oppression? It's a very valid point that you make, which is why we say that this type of unconditional, un Conditional, yeah. blind loyalty is reserved and restricted for the Ahlul Bayt. Good. Because why? They are deserving of this blind loyalty because of the trait of infallibility. Okay. We know that this Masoom Imam is not going to manipulate in anyone from the masses by forcing or extracting loyalty from them. Anyone who is non masoom no, loyalty is restricted over here okay. in that this is where we have the door. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us with the faculty of the intellect. Yes. And nobody has the right to command blind loyalty outside of, these, outside of the three entities that are mentioned from the Quran, the creator, the prophet, and the imam. Mm -hmm. From this, no, loyalty over here is restricted so long as the ruler is uh, ruling in regards to the teachings of the Quran and for the Ahlul Bayt in terms of that following and that mm -hmm. affiliation, we can say. But unrestricted blind loyalty is uh, reserved purely for Allah the Prophet and for Ahlul Bayt. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, to what extent does loyalty exist today? Loyalty, if we are measuring loyalty of the people, mm -hmm. and I say this to myself, mm -hmm. The days of Shahram Muharram supposed to be the days of refinement. Embracing the, uh, the utmost form of loyalty. Ahsantum. It's about self-refinement, self-purification. Yes. How am I able to measure my loyalty towards the Imams or towards mm -hmm. Allah? Yes. At every point in every year, a person needs to ask himself, rather every day. Yes. If I was in Karbala on the day of Ashura, would I be loyal to Imam Hussein Lala? Mm -hmm. And what is the proof for this? Our compliance towards the religion on a day-to-day -day basis indicates the extent of our loyalty towards Ahlul Bayt. Mm -hmm. The more compliant I am in my everyday life towards the religion, this in itself is an indicator of how loyal I would be to the Imam because compliance towards the religion is uh, compliance towards the Imam. Of course. Compliance towards the religion translates towards loyalty towards the Imam. Yes. Therefore, when I sit back and I ask myself, and this is tied to contemporary issues, mm -hmm. why is the awaited savior of mankind in a form of occultation? Yeah. What Very is the question. reason behind this? Millions of Lovers of Ahlul Bayt, millions of Muslims across the world, yet the world is filled with oppression and injustice, it yet is. the awaited savior of mankind is in occultation, waiting. Ya Habibi, waiting for what? Waiting for a, a nation of supporters that would be loyal to him. Wow. Therefore, when I want to ask myself, why is the Imam still in Ghaiba? This answer is connected to the same initial question. What would I do if I was there in Karbala on the day of Ashura? Would I be with Imam Hussein or against Imam al Hussein? To answer both these questions, I ask myself and I ask myself truthfully, how compliant am I to the teachings of the religion? Wow. How <clears throat> am I in regards to materialism and consumerism? Mm -hmm. Am I a slave of the dunya or am I a free soul? Yes. If I am a slave of the dunya and I prefer the dunya over the religion, then this shows me exactly why my Imam is in Ghaiba today. Mm -hmm. And this also shows me on which side of the camp I would be on the day of Ashura. Mm -hmm. And you have this issue of loyalty. Uh, people who failed in, in when it came to exhibiting loyalty towards Imam al Hussein yeah. um, during the time of Ashura, yes. yes, as we will see shortly, inshallah. Inshallah, now, Sheikhna, uh, if you will, inshallah, we'll go to a short break sure. and we'll come back shortly to our respective viewers. And Sheikhna, also, uh, you can turn into the screen right there uh, to see uh, the reports that uh, Brother Muhammad Ali goes around in Karbala 
uh, and he documents and uh, does reports uh, on the atmosphere, the mawakib, the processions. He's doing a very beautiful job um, on the streets of Karbala uh, to bring to you, uh, as well as myself and everyone, uh, at the comfort of your home, the atmosphere of Karbala. So to that report, we'll be back. Assalamu alaikum, peace and blessings of Allah be upon you all. Welcome to the holy land of Karbala. Uh, as you see now, my dear viewers, it is the days that, uh, you know, the days uh, ahead of the 10th of Muharram, where we are, you know, at this, uh, at this moment, uh, receiving with grief the days of Muharram, receiving with uh, grief the calamities that the Ahlul Bayt, peace and blessings of Allah be, be, uh, be upon them, uh, have been through. Uh, as you see the atmosphere now, uh, millions of pilgrims are flocking to the Holy Land of Karbala, flocking to the old city of Karbala to perform the pilgrimage uh, in the holy shrines of Imam Hussein and his brother Abu al-Fadl Abbas, peace and blessings of Allah be upon them. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the blessings of the Ahlul Bayt, peace and blessings of Allah be upon them, to uh, grant you all the uh, privilege to be in the Holy Land of Karbala, to feel the blessings to feel that uh, you are in a piece of paradise, a piece of paradise that has uh, interesting stories all around it. In every corner in the Holy Land of Karbala, every corner in this city, there is a very special story. Uh, and we'll start to uh, uh, tell you these stories and explain it to you. Uh, Back dear viewers, hope you inshallah enjoyed that uh, report uh, from Brother Muhammad Ali. Uh, I know Karbala is packed right now uh, and we are live from the holy city of Karbala with our very special guest joining us from the UK, Sheikh Muhammad Abbas Panju. Sheikh Nawak, once again, Assalamu Alaikum. Alaikum Assalamu Alaikum. Now, uh, Sheikh uh, going back to the discussion we had earlier, uh, revolving around the most important aspect within Islam, I know you mentioned that uh, obedience to the Ahlul Bayt uh, that is mentioned in the Quran, uh, so obeying Allah, the Rasul, and uh, the people who are authority over you, sure. uh, who are the Ahlul Bayt, and we also said that loyalty, blind loyalty is restricted only to Ahlul Bayt, others you don't have to blindly be loyal to them, Absolutely. be loyal to certain individuals, but sure. not blindly. Unfortunately, we have a lot of blind uh, loyalty uh, in our world today, Sheikhna, uh, as, as you, you have uh, probably seen. Unfortunately, uh, uh, within religious circles and non-religious yeah. circles, in essence, this, uh, this blind loyalty um, is a sense, is, is, is a state of ghafla. Mm -hmm. What's ghafla? Ghafla, a state of... Uh, of being, you could say, not alert. Uh -huh. You know, you're, so it's, you're it's, in a slumber mode. So it's like you're, you're awake, but you're asleep at the same time. Ashantum. You're not, you're not fully cognizant of the reality. Yeah. Sometimes people are in love with 
with personalities, are in love with ideologies that, not, that do not necessarily represent haq, mm -hmm. truth. The reason why we claim blind loyalty, unris, unris, unconditional loyalty towards Ahlul Bayt is because within the field of ideology, they are the representation of haq, truth in its entirety. Okay. So your loyalty to, towards them is loyalty towards haq, okay. where if we come out and we, we, we widen the parameters, you may be blind, you may be loyal to somebody who doesn't, blindly loyal towards somebody who may not necessarily represent haq in its entirety mm -hmm. or mixes haq with batil. Haq is partial, truth is partial, but falsehood is also involved within yes. it. So, and th this is where the role of our intellect comes in. Mm -hmm. But ideologically speaking, unrestricted loyalty, yes, for Ahlul Bayt, Ahl without Ali doubt. Uh, now, Sheikhna, when we uh, talk about loyalty, uh, we, you could talk about Prophet Muhammad, you could talk about Imam Ali, you could talk about Imam Hassan, which also was betrayed uh, and people were not loyal to him. Sure. But when you talk about loyalty, the only story that hits your mind is the story of Karbala. Without doubt. So, what's Imam Because 72 on, of, on Ashura and narration says that he left with thousands. Sure. What happened? Absolutely. You see, Karbala is that litmus test mm -hmm. in which you find that every value there is a positive and there is a negative to it each and every value that has a positive and a negative is exhibited inside of Karbala so for example the issue of loyalty yes. within Karbala within the revolution of Imam al Hussein, you find a group of individuals who are at the peak of loyalty yeah. like Abu al-Fadil Aslan new definition of loyalty Loyalty learned to become loyal by looking at the actions of Abu al Beautifully Fadr. said. Wow. And on the other hand, you have people who showed you how disloyal they can be yeah. and what this disloyalty entails. Yes. So by way of example, uh, the historians mentioned that as Imam al Hussein salam, was making his way to Karbala, he was some distance from the land of Karbala. He reached Karbala on the 2nd of Muharram, 61 AH. Mm -hmm. And as he was making his way in one of the stopping points, uh, because from Mecca towards Karbala, is a bit of a distance and there are many small villages at yes. which he stopped. He recruited people, as in people joined oh, his wow. revolution. Okay. People joined his movement and there are those who rejected him. Zuhair ibn al-Qain, for example, he met Imam al-Hussein while he was on his way from Mecca, while Imam was on his way from Mecca, heading towards uh, uh, Karbala. And in between from Kufa, they were diverted. This is where they met uh, Hura ibn Hura Yazid al Riyahi. Yes. So all these events were happening during this time. In mm -hmm. one of these stops, Imam al Hussein meets a person by the name of Amr ibn Qais al Mashriki. Mm -hmm. He, together with his nephew, they show that Imam al Hussein has camped outside at one of the stopping points yes. together with his family and companions. And he came to visit the Imam. Mm -hmm. Sayyid al-Shuhada looks at him and his nephew, Amr ibn Qais, al-Mashriki. Yes. He says to him, O oh, Amr, have you come here to support us? Support us. Yani, to support Imam al Hussein means to support Rasulullah. Because everybody was familiar with the tradition, Husaynu minni wa ana min al Hussein. Yeah. Ahabba Allahu man ahabba Hussein. Yani, to support Ras Imam al Hussein is to support Rasulullah. Mm -hmm. And sorry, that's good, but what's beautiful, someone also mentioned a few nights ago uh, that when Imam al Hussein was in Karbala, it means that Prophet Muhammad was in Karbala. Without then, doubt, just to add point, the message point. of Imam al Hussein was the message of Rasulullah. Yes. The etiquettes of Imam al Hussein, the etiquettes of Rasulullah. Mm -hmm. The physique of Imam al Hussein, the physique of Rasulullah. Yes. Everything and anything you find that Imam al Hussein was this reflection yes. of Rasulullah in itself. So, mm -hmm. therefore, to support Imam al Hussein, to be from the Ansar and the Ashab of Imam al Hussein, companions of Imam al Hussein, means to be from the companions of Rasulullah. Yes. So Imam al Hussein asked his companion, Amr, are you here to support us? Amr replies back by saying, Yabna Rasulullah, he says, I'm elderly person. I'm in old age now. I'm a businessman. I've got wife. I've got children. 
you know, I really can't make them orphans or my wife a widow at this age. I'm a businessman. I've got goods of other people and I despise that I should die while in my amana, in my trust, I have the goods of other people. Okay, the excuse that What an makes. excuse. Now the ta'aliq, the commentary or uh, comments on this, we will leave for after. Let me explain these two points of yes. loyalty for you. So you get an idea of the time, our viewers can get an idea of, of the time, the surrounding, the environment in which people lived and how the likes of Abu Fadl shone out as, mm -hmm. as shining stars. Mm -hmm. Imam al Hussein says to Amr, if this is your excuse, make sure that you travel very far and very at a place which is very, very distant from Karbala. Why? Because whoever hears our plea, whoever hears our call of help, whoever hears us calling out for supporters and sees that we are surrounded by enemies and does not respond back to us, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shall place within him or ordain within him eternal damnation. Wow. So he says, if you're not going to support us, be very, very far away. You find that the mm -hmm. excuse that is given over here is what? <clears throat> my family, my children, yeah. my wealth. Mm -hmm. This is one. On the other hand, we have within our history yes. that when Imam al Hussein alayhi salam reached Karbala, he had 600 people with him. When he reached Karbala? When he reached Karbala. Wow. This is as according to Tariq Mas'udi. Okay. Mas'udi is from the ulama of the Amma. He's not from oh. the Khasa, it's from the Amma. Uh -huh. But in any case, the, the rules and regulations in regards to authenticating history yes. is a little bit different. Uh, in fact, it's very different from the rules and regulations, ilm or rijal or diraya that are used in yeah, authenticating hadith for ahkam of the furu ad din for example. So in any case, Mas'udi narrates this. 600 people were with Imam al Hussein on the 2nd of Muharram. And on the 2nd of Muharram, when Imam al Hussein reached over here, and uh, in the story which is, or in the occurrence, the incidents which is very famously narrated that the horse refused to move forward so he changed his horse to a second horse and a third horse and the horse would not move forward. So Imam al Hussein asked the people, what is the name of this land? Somebody said the Ghadiriya, somebody said the Nainawa, until a third person came and said, this is the land of Karbala. Wow. And then Imam al Hussein said, this is the land of Karbin wa Bala. Wow. He came off his horse and he said to his companions, this is where we're going to get get killed, this is where our tents will be burnt, this is where we will be decapitated, this is where we will be mutilated. At this point, when he announced to his companions that this land of Karbala is the land of martyrdom, Mas'udi says that from these, majority of the people fled from Imam al Hussein. 500 horsemen and 100 foot soldiers abandoned Imam al Hussein. They were with him from Medina, wow. from Medina to Mecca, from Mecca all the way to Karbala. They reached Karbala. Imam al Hussein makes this declaration that your affiliation, your loyalty towards me will require sacrifice of your life. Are you ready for this? They abandoned. And it is over here that Imam al Hussein gave a khutbah. And in his sermon, he says, a part of the sermon, he goes on to say, An nasu abidu dunya. Yes. The people are slaves of this dunya. What deen? La ikun ala al sinatihim. Yahutuna hu madarat ma'aisha hu ma'aisha eh ma'aisha hum. Yes. Fa ida muhisu bil bala kalla dayanun. He says people are the slaves of this world. They only abide by the religion so long as it is beneficial for them. Wow. So long as their livelihood, their, their worldly affairs are not affected. As soon as they are afflicted by a test to choose between the deen or the dunya, Imam al Hussein says the religious people become very few. Wow. Ya'ani what? Pointing towards our conversation, loyalty. loyalty. Why did these group of people lack loyalty towards Imam al Hussein? Because they were blinded by hubbu dunya, their love for the dunya. Because they are so much in love, fascinated by this world, 
and the pleasures of this world and everything that the world has to give them in terms of comfort and luxury, you find that their compliance towards the religion mm -hmm. goes down. In fact, they see religion as a barrier towards enjoyment and prosperity in the mm -hmm. dunya. Now, uh, going back to one point you mentioned uh, about the businessman and asked for his support. Uh, now, did you know Hussein force loyalty onto them? Allah SWT forced the loyalty of people to Ahlul Bayt? Or is this something that people choose? Because it seems like it's, it's, it's enforced on them, sure. No, absolutely not. On the contrary, number one in Islam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says within the Quran, La ikraha fi deen. Okay. There is no compulsion in the religion. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, look, what is required from mankind, the purpose of your existence is obedience towards me. Yes. Obedience towards me entails loyalty towards Ahlul Bayt. Mm -hmm. We give you all the proof, you have all the ilm. At the end of the day, Allah has also given us free will to make the right decision. Yes. We can choose to be loyal or we can choose to be disloyal. <coughs> Excuse me. We can yes. choose to be disloyal. That choice comes back to us. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then tells us, and be wary that how you use your free will, you will then be questionable in regards to this on the day of judgment. So if you choose to be loyal to the Imam, know that your reward is in the Akhirah. And if you choose to be disloyal towards the Imam, know that the consequences for this are there in the Akhirah. Mm -hmm. So God does not impose this. And you find mm -hmm. this within the seerah of Imam al Hussein. Mm -hmm. Sorry, to yes. make the yeah, point yeah, absolutely cut clear yes. on the night of Ashura. Imam al Hussein gathers his companions and he says to them, yeah. You have fulfilled everything that was required from you as companions. I give you the freedom to now live in the darkness of the night. Wow. These people are after me. If they kill me, the story is over. They will not come after you. The only reason why they are willing to shed your blood is because you are the barrier for them to get to me. So I'm giving you the freedom to disappear, to go away in the, free, in the wow. darkness of the night. Which leader have you seen in the world, whether it is leader of a nation or the leader of an army who is under siege? There is an imminent war that is going to break out at dawn. And you find the leader of this army tells all his companions, tells all the people in his army, I give you the freedom to leave. You are not forced to be part of this wow. revolution. We barely see that in movies, let alone real life. Ya barakallah beek. And you find the answers of the companions willingly. They said to Imam al Hussein that even if we were to be killed 70 times and our ashes to be scattered and for us to be resurrected and be brought back to life we would not leave you why why did this loyalty how did they get to this level of loyalty because they understood they had ma'rifah yes. of the imam of their time that this is an embodiment and a representation of truth in its entirety our sacrifice our martyrdom around him due to our loyalty necessitates or is an equivalent to loyalty towards Rasulullah and defense of the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yes. Now, I mean, uh, when we look at the story of Ashura, I know you said on, on the 9th of Muharram, Imam Ali, um, Imam Hussain alayhi salam gave them the chance to go away. Sure. I mean, so isn't he, you know, giving them that slip that, you know what, if, if you don't want to shed your blood, you know, this is your chance. Sure. Now, if, if they took that chance, wouldn't that still be also loyalty to the Ahlul Bayt because Ahmed Hassan Islam is worried about them and he's saying, you know what, if you guys don't want to hurt yourselves, you know, you're, right. you're free to go. If they want, would they still be disloyal to the Ahlul Bayt? This is why... Because we, we know a few people left on Neva Ashura. Sure. Particularly you have this incident recorded by Mas'udi yes. in terms of these hundreds of people leaving on the second day of Muharram. Yeah. Actually, what you find is on the day of Ashura, you find people not from the camp of Imam al Hussein leaving, but you find people from the camp of Yazid coming into the. From the speech of Imam al Hussein. From the speech of Imam al Hussein, not even the speech, the salat of Imam al Hussein. And wow. this will we'll narrate this or we'll have a discussion on this on the night of Ashura, inshallah. Allah. But over here, this is why we say Karbala was an exception. These people exceeded, went above and beyond. Yes. And this is the lesson that we take. Yes, nobody could have blamed them that they, were, that, uh, that they didn't show loyalty towards the Imam. Hungry and thirsty for three days under the scorching, burning heat. They performed what was required from them. 
and if they would have left, perhaps, and Allah has knowledge for this, yani the words of the Imam, he says that I give you the liberty, yani khalas. if Imam Hussein says, I give you the liberty, Imam Hussein cannot take, go against his word and on the day of judgment, yeah. say to Allah, they left me, no, they will still be considered loyal, but lessons from companions like this is what, in order for us to excel, we need to go above and beyond. It is this above and beyond that allowed them to surpass every, every form of greatness. Yes. And in order for us to be part of those 313, we also need to go above and beyond. In fact, even in the materialistic world, Ya Habibi, you can become a doctor by getting 50% in all your classes in university. Does, or you can become an architect or an engineer by seeking to get 50% of the minimum pass grade. But do you find anybody who wants to excel, excel in his field of study of always course. aim for the minimum pass mark? Of course. No, they always uh, aim to achieve above and beyond. Yes. So the same thing that is applicable in this materialistic sense is also applicable in religion. Mm -hmm. It is expected from us that we will go above and beyond. And we do it with our hearts. We do it without any sort of force or coercion because we realize that this is the path of salvation. Yes. And uh, we did mention as well uh, how uh, <coughs> loyalty on this night uh, also links to one individual as well, as, as you mentioned, uh, where he set the standards uh, for a new level of loyalty. You know, when, when we look at uh, the loyal ones, uh, and uh, the one who said that uh, by Allah, if we were shattered across the, the, the earth and our, you know, if our uh, bodies were you know, shattered, Hayr Mudah al Asadi. Yes. Some narrations say he was over 90 years old. Absolutely. He yeah, was that individual sahabi. had the heart of, of a young man. Right. You know what I mean? So he, his, his loyalty exceeded. Uh, a few that might have been there. Absolutely, and Habib has got his own special position. Every yes. companion is an exceptional companion yes. uh, that was martyred with Imam al Hussein. But within this rank of exceptions, within this rank of glory, there are those who shine out a little bit more. Yes. Like you have Habib ibn Madahir, he's blessed and he was honored for his status, for example, by seeing that he was buried separately from the rest of the companions, all the companions of Imam al Hussein, great as they are, in one mass grave. And you find that for Habib, there is a special grave. And the same thing for Abul Fadil. Mm -hmm. The loyalty of Abul Fadil, and tonight is the night of Abul Fadil. Yes. And in Karbala, everywhere you go, you see tonight is the commemoration of Abul Fadl al Abbas, yes. and tears are shed for Kamar Bani Hashim. You find that Abul Fadil stood out in his loyalty. As we said, a new definition for loyalty that mankind has never seen. And there are many examples of this loyalty that Abul Fadil exhibited. Mm -hmm. You see, Abul Fadil, Kamar Bani Hashim, Abul Fadil was that personality who was the embodiment, yani, through his presence, the Ahlul Bayt felt ease and comfort he was the sense of security for Ahlul Bayt you can imagine that Amirul Mu'mineen alayhi salam on his deathbed after being struck by Ibn Muljim al -Lain, that as he gives his final wasiyah his testament and he ordains Imam Hassan al Mustaba as the next Imam and so on so forth the historians tell us that he calls Abul Fadil and he calls Sayyidah Zainab al-Kubra and he puts his hand on the hand of Sayyidah Zainab and he says to Abu al-Fadil that you are her protector. Wow. Yani kafil Zainab. And you find that Abu al-Fadil fulfilled this final testament of his father till the very last breath of his life. Even inshallah may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless all of us with the opportunity to visit Karbala and to perform inshallah. the ziyarah of Imam al Hussein. But when we go to the Mukhayyam, who is known as the Khaymaga, yes. when you go into the Mukhayyam and you go to see the tent of Imam al Hussein and the tent of Sayyidah Zainab and Imam Sajjad and uh, uh, Imam al Qasim, when you enter into the Mukhayyam, the first tent that you come across is who? 
the tent of Abu al Fadl al Abbas. And you find that in order to get to the tent of Imam al Hussein, you have to cross through the tent of Abu al Fadl. Meaning that even when they reached here on the day of Ashura, the tents that were put together in a circle close to each other, the very outward tent was the tent of Abu al Fadl. Meaning that he was the closest one to the enemy. If the enemy was to attack the tents, at the forefront would be Abbas alayhi salam, wow. Abu al-Fadil. To get to Ahl al-Bayt, you have to come through Abu al-Fadil. Abu wow. al-Fadil, the protector, this, this towering individual, this powerful individual, such that when the household comes together, when they look at him, they feel a sense of comfort and a yeah. sense of security, which is why when Abu al-Fadil was martyred, Sayyida Zainab alayhi salam weeps, she beats her face out of grief. And she says, it is now that our security has ended, our sense of security. Wow. The enemies did not have the jura. They did not have this ability to attack the women so long as Abu al-Fadil was, was present. Wow. Which is why you find that when the women were taken as prisoner, the first cry of Sayyidah Zainab al-Kubra, Wa Abbasa, where is that kafil? Wow. This is Abu al-Fadil who surpassed, this is number one, in terms of him as an individual being a sense of security yes. for Imam al hussein and for the women mm -hmm. of Ahlul Bayt. You find that from the acts of loyalty, you have on the 9th of Muharram, for example, as you know, from the 2nd to the 9th of Muharram, every day the army mm -hmm. that was being sent by Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad, yes. they began to become greater and greater in numbers. Mm -hmm. Yani every day he was sending mm -hmm. contingencies mm -hmm. to Karbala until their numbers swelled, some say to 30,000, some say to 70,000. Yes. And I've seen some historians even talk about 100,000. Yeah. And do you know what? Funnily, each and every one of them are correct. I say this every year in Muharram, almost every year in Muharram, all these recordings are correct. 30,000, 50,000, or 30,000, 70,000, and 100,000. Why are they all right? In that 100,000 includes the army, the number of the army with the reserves. You have 30,000 who are particularly there fighting, for Imam, fighting against Imam al Hussein on the basis of ideology. They thought by slaughtering the son of the holy prophet they are getting close to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wow they fought him on ideological, ideological ground just like the way you have these dawaish daesh and the isis and the uh, taliban and whatnot who slaughter people thinking that they are gaining proximity towards allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the roots of this type of uh wahash uh well, the savagery of these savage people. behavior under the name of the religion. Hi, the root of this is Karbala. This is why we even say to non-Muslims that if you want to understand Daesh, you want to understand the Taliban and how they justify mass killing, murder, this savagery. Study Ashura. Study Ashura. You'll find that the root of this behavior was there. In any case, so 30,000 people in this way, 70,000 people, those who were within, who were part of the army, but not within the immediate precincts of the battlefield. You can say those who are in the second, third and fourth ranks, because the army was great. Sometimes when you, when you speak to, uh, when, you, uh, when, you, when you look into the historical accounts, you find that perhaps, perhaps it was not a far-fetched idea that the army stretched, you know, just about to uh, outskirts of Karbala. Yeah. Yani, yeah. 50, 30,000 people is not a small number. It occupies space. And you can imagine that they've seized Imam al Hussein from all four directions, such that a part of Yazid's army was leaning towards the direction of Musayyab, Musayyab which is another 30, 40 kilometers yeah. from Karbala. Yet, you, this is the vastness of the army in those who were uh, directly involved in the killing and the fighting, those who are in the third and fourth battalions, and then those who are there in the reserves. And each and every one of them are guilty, as we read in Ziyarat Ashura. Mm -hmm. yes. All of them, the category of people, even those who are not present, mm -hmm. but did not condemn, even Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and to me even guilty. Wow. Ala Abu al-Fadil, on the 9th of Muharram, as the army keeps gathering, they reached their peak in terms of their numbers on the 9th of Muharram. Now, Ba'ad, 
the force of Yazid ibn Muawiyah la'natullahi alayhi is at full force. This is now the peak, the greatest army of the greatest empire in the known world. The Islamic empire was the most powerful empire at that time, stretching to over 40 present day countries. And the leadership of this empire is this Ibn Haram, Yazid ibn Muawiyah, la'anatullah alayhi. The head of the army, he has sent the strongest empire, the full wrath of the known Khalifa of that time against Imam al Hussein, yeah. He sends Shimar bin Dil Joshan alayhi la'ana. Shimar bin Dil Joshan comes on the 9th of Muharram towards the tents of Imam al Hussein, and he cries out, where are our cousins? Wow. Yani Shimar bin Dil Joshan was from the tribes of, uh, from, uh, affiliated Bani with Kilab. the tribe of Bani Kilab. Yeah. And Abu al-Fadil alayhi salam, together with his brothers, he had, there were four sons in total. So Abu al-Fadil's brothers, they were by the name of Ja'far, Abdullah and Uthman. Amir al named his son Uthman, not after Uthman ibn Uth Affan, but Islam. Uthman ibn Mad'un. No, no, yeah. no, uh, during the time of Islam, yeah. but he named his son Uthman in honor of the companion of Rasulullah by the name of Uthman ibn Mad'un who was a close companion to Rasulullah and was shaheed in one of the battles. Mm -hmm. Loyal. So Amir al said, I'm naming my son in reverence to him. Mm -hmm. So Abu al-Fadl's brothers, three brothers and himself. Shimar bin Dil Joshan calls them. Do we have time or are we going on break? Um, we have a minute about to, before we go into a break and then we can... Ah, so, so Shimar calls out and he says, where are our relatives, Abbas and his brothers? We are here to offer you amnesty from the side of Yazid ibn Muawiyah and Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad. Wow. Wow. I mean, what? The response. Who do they, they, they go to Abu al-Fadl out of everyone. They go to Abu al-Fadl. And you know, there is a wisdom, Habibi Ahmad. Wisdom, yani we say wisdom over here. Reason. reason. There was a reason. Why Shimmer ibn Dil Joshan targeted Abu al-Fadil in particular for this Aman? Mm -hmm. Why is it that we don't find that somebody came and gave Habib ibn Madahir Aman yeah. or Muslim ibn Awsaja or Abis from the tribe of Bani Shakir, the formidable tribe, the likes of Abis. Or the Asadis that were here in the Karbala. The Asadis that were here in Karbala. So why is it that they targeted Abu al-Fadil? Yeah. And it is important over here that when Shimar bin Dil Joshan called out to Abu al-Fadil and his brothers, Abu al-Fadil didn't even honor them with a response. Mm -hmm. They were not even worthy talking to. Mm -hmm. And then Imam al Hussein says to Abu al-Fadil, he says to him, Abbas, answer back to them. Even if he's a Fasik, answer back to them. Look at the akhlaq. The manners that is wow. Mannerisms that are manifested. These are people who are under siege, thirsty for, from the 7th of Muharram, huh? Wow. Yeah, from, from tomorrow, from tomorrow morning. From tomorrow morning. And which is why it is also important for us, the four viewers, between now and Ashura, every time you drink water, count mm -hmm. the number of times you drink water and remember the thirst. Particularly Zawarwa here in Karbala. Allahu Akbar. 43, 44 degrees heat. Yani, I think what today morning at about half past 10, the temperature was 39 degrees. Ya akhi, you don't drink water every half an hour. You can, you can become unconscious due to the heat. Yeah. If you're not hydrated, you can faint. Every time you drink water, 39 degrees. And now we're not able to handle the heat. We're sitting in under air condition and madri shu. Yani, these things when you come and you wonder, how is it that the four-year-old daughter of Imam al Hussein spent three days thirsty in this desert heat, 39 degrees, and we know that the day of Karbala was even hotter than this, hotter. as we will see on the, the night of The desert is way hotter than the... the yeah. Ya yeah, Akhi, so, during these three days, a person, however many times they drink water, whenever they drink water, step back and contemplate how did Imam al Hussein and his companions, mm -hmm. how did the children and the women, Abdullah al Radi, survive three days mm -hmm. and for what? Mm -hmm. This is important. Let's find out after uh, the short break, if you want, inshallah, Shaykhna. Sure. Respective viewers, do stay tuned for we'll going to a short break and we'll be back very shortly. Uh, so don't go away. Two percent.
جزرم حسین نزاسی سخا کاش هر ابدم الله جویا یا حسین صداسی جویا یا حسین صداسی جزرم کنان باسی جزرم حسین نزاسی سخا کاش هر ابدم الله جویا یا حسین صداسی جزرم حسین نزاسی سیخا کاش هر ابدم الله جویا یا حسین صداسی جویا یا حسین صداسی کبکی گبله همین امت پیغم برادیم کبکی گبله همین امت پیغم Respective viewers, welcome back. Hope, inshallah, uh, enjoyed those uh, beautiful scenes from Karbala. Now we are back live from the holy city of Karbala with our very special guest from the United Kingdom, uh, Habib Sheikhna uh, Muhammad Abbas Panju. Welcome back. Allah khalikum shah. Now, before the break, we talked about, you know, uh, in these days, when you look at the temperature on our iPhones or our, uh, you know, smartphones, you see them sure. 39 degrees in Karbala particularly. Now everyone knows that uh, in the desert, it's way hotter than the city. Sure. You know, because here there's air conditioning, there's uh, there's so much stuff that you can cool down with water. Right. In the desert, there's absolutely nothing. It's the sun and the sand. That's it. Even the wind that blows across the desert is that hot, humid sand. I've witnessed that. A few weeks ago, and for the dear viewers that were in Karbala a few weeks ago, in Arafah or the days coming to Arafah when you walk on the streets of Karbala in midday you can feel a hair blower Sheikh. yeah it's, it's, it's like a blower in your face from the heat so we can imagine I mean you mentioned you know, even if you drink water count how many times and do say you know Ram Sadiq says do recite uh, the blessings on uh, send the blessings on Imam yeah. Al Hussein, salute yeah. him, yeah. and uh, send Laana, invoke Laana on his killers yes. every yes. time you drink water. Because when you cool your own body and quench your own thirst, and remember the thirst of the children mm -hmm. uh, on the day of Ashura, and remember the thirst of the one who went to the water and never drank and never drank it, Allah. And this is this is this is what makes Abu Fadl Abu Fadl, um, you know, you a new tried. definition of tried. loyalty. And this is what we're saying: new definition of loyalty. When he got to the Forat, no one would have blamed him. Absolutely not. He picked up the water, and you look at the poem that he recites: Ya nafsu min ba'dil Husayni huni. Yani, Abu Fadl says to the nafs, how can you? There is no, to paraphrase, there is no meaning in life after you. There is, there is no pleasure in life after you, Ya Hussein. Yani, how is it possible that I drink water while you are thirsty and under siege? For Abu al-Fadil, loyalty was such that I cannot have quenched my thirst such, so long as my Imam is thirsty. And everything you had to have one step back. This was the loyalty of Abu al-Fadil, you know, and starting from this thing of this Aman, you find, as we were saying before yes, the break, before the break, yeah, the Aman of Shimar. Shimar al-Lain comes <clears throat> and he says to Abu al-Fadil, you and your brothers have Aman, loyalty. Why? You know, it's important that we ask these questions, why? 
and how important this response of Abu al-Fadl was and what it signified. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Shimr is not a person who had any sort of mercy in his heart and neither did he have any concern for his kinship or his family members and ties. It's not that he had any sort of virtue inside of him where he said, you know what, this is my family member. Let me intercede and let me give him amnesty from the goodness of my heart mm -hmm. or because they are from my tribe. I've mm -hmm. got some tribalistic affiliation or loyalty. Mm -hmm. La Abadan. No? These are the worst people yeah. to have lived on this earth. The most animalistic and vicious, yani the embodiment of deceit and evil in its entirety most manifested through the likes of Shimar and that. If they butcher a small child, ya what akhi, do you expect? Ahsan, their offering of amnesty towards Abu al-Fadil wow. was actually a show and a display of their cowardice, of the fear within them. How? How? The only reason that they gave Abu al-Fadil aman is because they were scared to fight him in battle. Wow. So they thought their cunning, vicious plan, they thought that Abu al-Fadil being the commander of the army, the flag bearer, the most courageous, strongest person within the army of Imam al Hussein, if we are able to give amnesty to the flag bearer of the army, if we are able to give amnesty to the commander of the army, and we are able to persuade him to leave the army of Imam al Hussein, right. what happens? The Finish. entire army of Imam al Hussein collapses. Yeah. Yeah, and he, obviously, they didn't know the metal and, the, and the, the character, the blood and the flesh of the people who were with Imam al Hussein. An underestimate on their side. They yeah. had absolutely no idea. These men went above and beyond. But what we're saying is we're analyzing the mentality of the enemy. Yeah. They thought, like in this day and age, if the general of the army or the commander of the army betrays goes them. into mutiny or betrays, what happens? The rest of the entire army disintegrates, like happened at the time of Imam Hassan al-Mujtaba. And like we saw in Spiker not, not a while ago, when the generals left and the, everyone was butchered and Ahsan, in the fact, army fell. In fact, Bain al Qawsain, from what is understood, is that it was the generals who sold out the cadets. Yeah. They are the ones who went and uh, betrayed the cadets yeah. for that war. For what? For dunya. Ham, you find over here, Shimmer comes with this mentality wow. that if we are able, politics, siyasa, yeah. if we are able to give amnesty to the strongest person in the army, because within Abu Fadil, people saw death. This is somebody who is a known seasoned warrior from the time of Sifin. Look at what when he enters into the battlefield and he comes forward and he says uh, when he enters into the battlefield Wow. He recites his poetry, he says that to, uh, to translate parts of it, that uh, I will strike you with my sword until you dispatch and you scatter away from killing my master. Indeed, I am Abbas, the son of Ali. Wow. When he went into the battlefield, they says, For in kalabat maymanatahum maysara wa maysaratuhum maymana. Wow. He disintegrated the right wing and the left wing in war your strength is denoted based on how strong you are able to maintain ground not only was the left wing able to maintain its ground or the right maintain its even their positions became scattered wow. he threw the entire army into disarray the maktal says four thousand archers were guarding the forat abul fadil by himself this past all of them. Mm -hmm. Within the maktal it is written, they didn't know whether it was mm -hmm. Abbas or it was Ali himself mm -hmm. on the battlefield. And just to mention, Shaykhna, uh, uh, Al-Furat, which, which they also refer to as Al-Alqami, uh, the yes. river that Abu al-Fadr reached, is right here. Allah Right Allah. close to the channel. Sure. And then uh, just 50 meters away, you have the, the left hand of Abu al-Fadr where, where it fell. So the, the, the distance that Abu al-Fadr traveled, and you can see it, how this whole area was covered with, with, with army. 
as you just mentioned, sure. the, the, the right wing and the left wing, this is all army. And Abu al-Fadl cut right through them. Absolutely. You know, th th there was no diversion going around or something. Through the army. Through the entire army. And this is, they saw within Abbas death. And hence they knew that this is the foundation, this is the pillar stone of the entire army. Yes. And this is why when you find that Abu al-Fadl asked for permission to go into the battlefield, Imam al Hussein says to him, Wa anta alama tu askari. Wow. You are the sign, you are the symbol of my army. If you go into battlefield, something happens to you, our entire army is disintegrated. This is when Abu al-Fadil was the only one remaining in the tent. Imam al Hussein says, you yourself are an entire army. This, so Shimar bin Dil Joshan realized this, Alayh. And this was Yani from Makar. It was a deceitful plan that they should try and betray him, try and lure him by giving him amnesty. The reply of Abu al-Fadil being what? La anakallah wa la ana amanak. He says, may the damnation of Allah be upon you and this amnesty. You give us amnesty while the grandson of Rasulullah is under siege and you want to take his life. Never shall we leave him. From this stances like this, you find that Imam al-Sadiq says, Wa ashadu annaka balaghta fin nasiha. Yani, you exceeded every, every expectation when it came to loyalty. You surpassed every boundary. Mm -hmm. You look at the manner in which uh, Abu al-Fadil was martyred. You know, the narrations mention that he reached towards the Furat and he conquered the Furat. He picks wow. up the water and he looks at it, he doesn't drink, he drops it back down. This famous poetry, the narration mentions that when he was coming back from the Furat, he had the water uh, container, the water bag around his shoulder. He had his sword and he had his shield. From the Furat, I think perhaps because of our time, I will just mention to you aspects Inshallah, of yeah. the martyrdom of Abu We have a couple of five Fadil. minutes, of, uh, I think. Yeah, five minutes. I will mention for you aspects of the martyrdom of Abu al-Fadil. That when he was, when he rode his horse from the Furat, his only goal was getting water to the children. Sakina. The only thing in his mind was Rukayya or Sakina. This four-year-old daughter of Aba Abdullah who is waiting with a cup, empty water cup, at the front of the tent waiting for her uncle Abbas to come back. Shimmer and Umar ibn Sa'ad cry out, attack him from every direction. For indeed, if this water reaches the tent, our entire army will be annihilated. So then, Arbab al-Makatil, the narrators of the Makatil mentioned that they began to shot, shoot arrows at Abu al-Fadil from every direction. And they only shot arrows. You don't hear that they came forward with swordsmen. Or from distance. From distance. Cowards, Cowards. they were. Until Abu al-Fadil, as he was defending himself from these arrows with his shield, he, on his horse, he went through this area around the Alkami that is filled with palm trees. And one of these kuffar by the name of Zayd ibn Rukad, yes. he hid behind the palm tree and severed the right arm of Abu al-Fadir. Hakim bin Tufail, a few moments later, severs the left arm of Abu al-Fadir. This is Abu al-Fadil on a horse without two arms. The narrations mention that he held on to the flag with his chest and what remained from his arms. His concern being the water bag. Even at this point, they began shooting arrows at Abu al-Fadil. And from here, there are two arrows that stand out from the thousands that were shot at Abu al-Fadil. The first arrow was the arrow that pierced the eye of Abu al-Fadil. So the narration mentions that an arrow was shot, it pierced his eye. The second arrow was the arrow that pierced the water bag. 
And with this, you know, the way the poet says, as the water began to drip down from the water bag into the, onto the sands of Karbala, together with this water, the hopes of Abul Fadil were also watered away in terms of getting water back to the children. If I'm to turn back towards the Forat, how do I fill the water bag when I don't have any arms? As Abul Fadil lay on his horse in this state, the Maktal says that one of the enemies came. فَذَرَبَهُ بِالْعَمُودِ عَلَىٰ رَعْسِهِ فَفَلَكَ حَامَتَ The narration mentions that while he had no arms, as he was on his horse, covered in blood, one of the enemies came and they struck Abu al-Fadil with a metal pole at the back of his head. They split open the skull of Abu al-Fadil. They split open the skull of Abu al-Fadil. Abu al-Fadil fell down from his horse. Every companion of Imam al Hussein who fell down, they fell down onto the plains of Karbala, but Abu al-Fadil fell in a different manner. A person who had no arms falls face first on the sands of Karbala, such that they state this arrow that had pierced his eye was pushed in even deeper when Abu al-Fadil fell face first on the plains of Karbala. And he cries out, Alayka bin salam Ya Aba Abdullah. Imam al Hussein comes running to Abu al Fadil. After every three, four steps, Imam al Hussein takes, he falls down to the ground crying, Al An in Kasara Dahri. Now my back is broken. Until he gets to Abu al Fadil, and I don't know. What went through the heart of Imam al Hussein when he sees his brother covered in blood without any two arms? And I end with this one statement which is extremely painful. When Imam al Hussein saw Abu al Fadl in this way, he took the head of Abu al Fadl and he put it on his lap. He begins to wipe the blood from the face of Abu al Fadl. Abu al-Fadil moved his head away from the lap of Imam al Hussein. He did this a second time. Second time, Abu al-Fadil moved his head. Imam al Hussein says to him, My brother Abbas, why do you move your head away from my lap? Abu al-Fadil says to him, My master, you are putting my head on your lap during my final moments. But I think about where your head or on whose lap is your head going to be during your final moments. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun wa la hawla wa la quwata illa billah wa la natullah ala qawmi al-dhalimeen. I mean, Shaykh, to, to, to listen to the maqtada of Al-Fadr Abbas uh, is, is something that's um, you know, out, out of this world because Honestly, even in movies, you don't see brutality like this. Um, and, you know, hopefully we can... Uh, you know, th there's no one that can understand the level of loyalty that Abu Abbas reached. Even, as you mentioned, the word loyalty does not even come close to the loyalty of Abu Fadl Abbas. So, inshallah, we can, you know, in these nights, as you said, when we drink water, let us remember Abu Fadl Abbas, السلام, how he felt the coolness of the water. But yet he refused it before his brother, Abu Fadl Hussain Shaykhna, I would like to thank you very, very much for joining us tonight. Inshallah, tomorrow we can uh, talk about another tragedy, Al Qasim uh, uh, and uh, link it to uh, the next topic, Inshallah. Respected viewers, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Hopefully, Inshallah, we can learn from Abu Fadl Abbas and from the companions of Imam Al Hussain how to stay loyal to the Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam, the most important aspect within Islam. Thank you very much. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.